Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the internal rate of return. And so in order to talk about the internal rate of return, we need to first discuss financial transactions. And so a typical financial transaction involves a number of payments made, or what we call cash flows out, at various moments in time, as well as a number of payments received, or cash flows in. And so the interest rate for that transaction, at which the value of all the cash flows out is equal to the cash flows in, is called the internal rate of return, or IRR for short. And so for example, the yield rate J for the price of a bond would be an internal rate of return because the formula for the price of the bond can be viewed as a financial transaction, where the cash flow out, or the payment made, would be the price of the bond and the cash flows in or the payments received would be the coupons and the redemption amount, right? And so the yield rate is the interest rate for the bond at which the cash flows in are equal to the cash flows out. And so the yield rate would be an internal rate of return, okay? But more generally, if we were to look at a timeline for a set of cash flows in and cash flows out, let's consider a transaction that consists of a single amount C sub zero invested at time equals zero, and then several future payments to be received at times one, two, and three up until some time in the future, T equals N. And so I'll label those amounts as C sub one, C sub two, C sub three, all the way up through C sub N. And so for this scenario, we could set up an equation of value where that initial investment would be the present value of our future payments. And so we could write the equation that C sub zero is equal to c sub one times the present value factor to the power of one plus c sub two times the present value factor to the power of two plus all the other future payments including c sub three up until c sub n times the present value factor to the power of n, right? So because c sub zero is our present value or our investment at t equals zero, then the rest of these payments would need to be valued at time equals zero as well and so we would multiply c sub one by the present value factor to the power of one, and that will bring it back to t equals zero. And then we added the second payment, c sub two, and multiplied it by the present value factor squared, because that will bring it back two years to time equals zero, and this would continue on for all of the payments received up until that final payment, c sub n, where we multiply it by the present value factor to the power of n, to bring it back those n number of years to time equals zero where the present value is valued. And so this is our equation of value for this scenario. And so we could rewrite each of these present value factors and we would have that c sub zero is equal to c sub one times one divided by one plus i plus c sub two times one divided by one plus i squared. And then we would continue to add up until c sub n times one divided by one plus i to the power of n. And this interest rate i in these present value factors is the internal rate of return for this transaction that we are looking at here. And so if we knew the value of c sub zero, c sub one, c sub two, and so on, we could then solve for i and find that internal rate of return. But if we go back to this equation right here where we have the present value factors in their V notation and we subtract C sub zero, that initial investment from both sides, then we'll have that zero is equal to negative C sub zero plus C sub one times V plus C sub two times V squared and all the way up until C sub N times V to the power of N. And so this equation right here leads to our general statement that will tell us how to solve for the internal rate of return given a set of cash flows. And so in general, the internal rate of return for cash flows C sub zero through C sub n is any interest rate that satisfies the following equation, where we have the sum from k equals zero to n of some payment C sub k times the present value factor to the power of t sub k, which is equal to zero, right? This equation right here is just another way of writing what we have down here, right? We have the sum of our payments times the present value factor to the power of whatever time that payment was made, and that is equal to zero. And so whatever interest rate makes this equation true, that is what the internal rate of return would be.
And of course, that internal rate of return would be a compound interest rate, not a simple interest rate. All right, and so then also know that this equation and this equation are valued at time equals zero, right? That is the valuation point that we have chosen, and that is typically the most common way of setting up this equation, but I'm going to show you in our example problem coming right up that I actually prefer to evaluate our equation of value at the ending date t equals n for our transaction rather at the beginning date at t equals zero. And so I'll show you that in our example, but just know that there are many different ways that you could set up the equation of value and so this is not a cut and dry equation that you have to set up to solve for the internal rate of return. And so that might be a little confusing, but let's look at an example problem where I will show you what I mean. And so here's our example problem. We have that a transaction has net cash flows of C sub zero, which is equal to negative 1000, C sub one, which is equal to 450, and C sub two, which is equal to 630 and they are made at time zero, one, and two respectively, and we want to determine the internal rate of return for this transaction. And so if we set up a timeline for this scenario, we're gonna to need to include time zero, one, and two, and so we'll have three points of interest. Our first one will be time equals zero, our second one is time equals one, and our third one is time equals two. And we know that each of these cash flows occur at each of these times respectively. And so at time equals zero, we have our initial investment of $1,000. That's why it's negative. When you see a negative cash flow, that just means that that was invested. That was a payment rather than a payment received, right? That would be a cash flow out and not a cash flow in like these other two cash flows are. And so we'll have negative 1,000 at time equals zero. At time equals one, we have a cash flow in or a payment received of 450, right? That's C sub one. And so we will have 450. And remember that that is positive. And then at time equals two, we have another cash flow in or another payment received of 630. And so we will have positive 630. Okay, and so then we can set up an equation of value for this scenario with these three cash flows. And so if we value it at time equals zero, we will have that zero is equal to that cash flow of negative 1000. And since that's being made at time equals zero, we do not multiply it by any present value factor. And then we will add that to 450 times V to the power of one or the present value factor to the power of one. And then we will add that to 630 times V squared or the present value factor squared. Okay, and so this is what the equation of value would look like when we value it at time equals zero. But what I want you to notice here is that this would require some extra steps in order to solve for the interest rate I or the internal rate of return, right? Because the present value factors are equal to one divided by one plus that interest rate to the power of whatever the power is for your present value factor. And so it would be a little cumbersome to deal with that interest rate in the denominator of the expression. And so instead of setting up our equation of value at the beginning date, time equals zero, I'm going to value it at the end date, time equals two. And so that's going to look a little bit different. And here's how. We'll have that zero is equal to that first cash flow of negative 1,000. And so we'll have negative 1,000, but then we need to value that at time equals two. And so we will multiply this by the accumulation factor squared, right? We'll multiply by one plus i, squared and that will bring that cash flow to time periods into the future and it will be valued at time equals two. And then for our next cash flow, we'll have plus 450 and that needs to be multiplied by the accumulation factor to the power of one because it takes place at time equals one and we want to bring it forward one time period from time equals one to time equals two. And so we'll multiply by one plus i to the first power. And then we will add our final payment or final cash flow of 630, and that will not be multiplied by anything because that payment is made at time equals two, where we are valuing our equation of value. All right, and so these two equations are the same, they are just valued at different points in time, right? If you were to solve for the internal rate of return, this rate i and this equation, it will be the same as if you solved for it in this equation. And so when you wanna solve for an internal rate of return, I would always recommend that you set up your equation of value to be valued at the end date rather than the beginning date. I think it's gonna be a whole lot easier for you to solve for that rate.
And so now I think we're ready to solve for the rate in this particular problem. And so I'm going to remove this other equation of value and we will solve for i in this equation of value. Okay, and so what we're going to do here in order to solve for i, because it initially looks pretty tricky, but there's actually a really simple solution to solving for i, and that is to treat this equation as a quadratic equation, because really that's what it is. And so what I mean is watch what happens if we let one plus i be equal to x, right? So if we let x be equal to one plus i, then that means that zero will be equal to negative 1,000 times x squared plus 450 times x plus 630, right? So everywhere we had one plus i, we replaced with x, and so now you can see that we have this quadratic equation here that we can solve using the quadratic formula, right? We can solve for x in this equation using the quadratic formula, and then whatever x is equal to, we can set that equal to one plus i and solve for i, the internal rate of return. And so here's the quadratic formula. Remember that a, b, and c all correspond to different parts of your quadratic equation, where a is the coefficient of your x squared term, b is the coefficient of your x to the first power term, and c is the value of your term that doesn't have a variable. And so in this case, we will have that x is equal to negative 450 plus or minus the square root of 450 squared minus four times negative 1,000 times 630, and that will be divided by two times negative 1,000. All right, and so if you plug this into your calculator, you will get two different values of x, right? You'll get one value of x for when you add the square root and you'll get another value for when you subtract that square root. And so those two values of x that we'll get is that x is equal to negative 0.6 and x is equal to 1.05. Okay, and so if we clean up our work here, we can now solve for i, the internal rate of return, by setting one of these values of x equal to that interest rate i. And so notice if we were to use this first value of negative 0.6, we'll have that negative 0.6 is equal to one plus i, and then to solve for i, we would subtract one from both sides, and so we'd have negative 1.6 is equal to i, but it doesn't make sense for our interest rate to be negative, and so we're not going to use that value of x, and so we'll cross that one out. What we are going to use is 1.05, and so we'll have that 1.05 is equal to one plus i, and now if we subtract one from both sides, we will find that i is equal to 0.05. And so we found that the internal rate of return for this transaction is 0.05 or 5%. Okay, and so that is the process for solving for the internal rate of return, specifically when you have three cash flows like we did in this problem, right? We had negative 1,000, 450, and 630. But if you had more than three cash flows, the equation of value would get increasingly difficult to solve because instead of having a quadratic equation, you would have a third degree polynomial. And that is very difficult to solve by hand. And so that would require the use of a financial calculator, which I plan to show you how to use in a future video. And so for now, just know that if you have three cash flows, you can solve for the internal rate of return by hand by using the quadratic formula like we did in this example. Okay, so that's really all there is to know about the internal rate of return. It's just the interest rate that satisfies the equation of value for a transaction of cash flows. All right, and so if you wanna see some more examples, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.